as we have talked about before, during the Reformation, we first get Martin Luther, we get Lutheranism. Then we get Calvin, and we get Calvinism. And then we get uh, these other guys, one guy named Zwingli. That's a great name, Zwingli. Say that five times fast. And very, very quickly, we get this nice phrase from the book, an explosion of Protestant sects. Right? So we have hundreds, and today probably even thousands, of variations on what Martin Luther said, what Calvin said, what Spengler said, what uh, John Woolman said, all sorts of different groups came out of this Reformation. So almost everybody's church that you think about today, unless you're Catholic, is going to be the result of one of these explosions of Protestant sects. So we've already done some of this in our notes, but Lutheranism, Calvinism are big examples. We could add Methodism. We could add Quakerism. We could add Evangelism. We could add all kinds of things. One of the ones to pay a little bit of attention to, just for its, uh, its sort of remarkable quality here, was the Anabaptists. And they were in the city of Münster in Germany, famous for its Münster cheese, which you might like on your sandwiches. And the Anabaptists there were a little crazy. First of all, they said you should be baptized as an adult. That's crazy. That really offended pretty much everybody. Their reasoning is, why don't you wait to choose to enter the church before you get baptized into the church? Infants can't choose what they do. So wait until you're an adult, choose to enter the church, and then we will baptize you. That's sort of what Anna baptism means. And this offended the Protestants and the Catholics. And what's remarkable about the Anabaptists is that's the first time that Catholics and Protestants actually got together to go to war against somebody else. Martin Luther said, it's okay, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And those guys, the Anabaptists, are far worse than the Catholics. Now, they were also doing some other kind of crazy stuff. They took the city of Munster over, they kicked out people who didn't agree with them, and they did things like sharing uh, all property. So nobody owned anything in the city. You could walk into anybody's apartment and hang out. Um, you could sort of take stuff and give stuff. It was like this ideal society. That's what they thought. Um, there was some wife sharing also going on, so a little bit uh, icky by standard Christian morality, and uh, the Catholics and the Protestants gathered together, ganged up, and killed the Anabaptists. They actually took their leaders, put them in iron cages, and hung the cages up from the cathedral wall, and uh, just sort of let them sit there forever. Those cages are still there. You can go look at them if you want. If you go to Minster, you'll see the cages. So, uh, modern-day sects, that are descendants from the Anabaptists, Mennonites, uh, Baptists in the United States and elsewhere, and uh, probably most famously, the Amish. Right, so the Amish are people who still hold these, uh, these beliefs, very traditional, um, you know, they, they speak German, or some, they, their German is actually more like Old German. What? And they, they really hold to these, these old beliefs. Also, some good stuff in the news right now about hate crimes among the Amish. Amish people attacking other Amish people. Shaving off their beards. Not very, not very nice. Okay, and on to the English Reformation. 
this is a this is a sort of a complex thing. We we did discuss some of this before, so a lot of this will be reviewed. It's weird that the English went through any kind of reformation at all, because we know that in 1521, the King of England, Henry VIII, condemned the Reformation. He got a special gold star from the Pope for being a defender of the faith. Because he said, Martin Luther, you are wrong. But not much long after that, in 1527, Henry asked the Pope for an annulment of his marriage. to Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon was the, of Aragon, you see, was from the kingdom which was half of Spain. Remember the uh, people who funded Columbus? She was related to them. So, as for the annulment, and as we reviewed yesterday, the reason the Pope didn't want to give the annulment was not because he thought divorce was bad, but because he didn't want to upset Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Empire. So he didn't get the annulment. For political reasons. Rather than religious reasons. So we have basically a political crisis of the king saying, I need a son. I've been married to this woman for 18 years, and all I have is one daughter. She isn't working. I need a new wife. I'm already in love with Anne Boleyn. Pope, help me out here. No, no, no. I can't do that. I defend Charles V, who's really the defender of the, of the faith. So, no. There were a lot of Protestants in Henry's sort of inner circle of advisors, and they said, Henry, there's an easy way out of this. Let's go Protestant." Then you won't have to answer to the Pope. And I have a plan. We'll make a new church that has you as the ultimate head of it. So you just give yourself a divorce. Right on. So Henry decides to do that. So that was in, let's see, 15, well, in the 1530s. Um, Henry created the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. And the major difference between Church of England and the Catholic Church was simply that the king was the head of it, not the pope. So Henry VIII, right under him is the Archbishop of Canterbury, who at this point is Thomas Cran Cranmer. Right, those two guys are the heads of the English church. 1534, just to make it official, the Act of Supremacy, passed by Parliament says that it makes it really official. Henry VIII, the king, is the head of the Anglican Church. <coughs> That's what the supremacy over the church. Again, think about the weird intersection of government and religion. Parliament passes a law to say that the head of our religion is our king. There is no separation of church and state in that scenario, is there? Okay, so this, everything is very, very tightly put together. Um, of course, there are people who didn't like that, and we start to see uh, religious violence. Catholics are getting killed. The 
because of this decision. Anybody who remains Catholic sort of is dangerous to the king, so he has them killed. We also see confiscation of church lands. Our textbook only talks about this in the case of England, but this was done everywhere some people converted to Protestantism. The church, as I said, I believe, is still the biggest landowner in the world, the Catholic Church. And at the time it sure was, and what the kings would get from this switching to Protestantism is all the land owned by the Catholic Church. All the monasteries, I mean, all the churches, all the all this huge amounts of land. And the monastery is not just the building. It was a building and a bunch of land around it. And they were able to take that straight out. And then what Henry did was very smart. He then divided it up among the noblemen. I know you're a little bit upset about becoming Protestant. Will this make it easier if I give you three new towns? that you didn't have before. Oh yeah, that takes this thing off. That's three new towns worth of taxes I get to collect. Right, so he creates a very uh, worldly incentive for these men to switch their religious preferences. So, divides that land, whoops. <coughs> he divides the land among the nobility to gain favor. Intelligently, Henry did not change much about the religion. Remember, he had written a letter saying, Martin Luther is bad. His Reformation is bad. So he was mostly pro-Catholicism. So he just sort of slid everything over just to be under his control. He didn't change the prayers. He didn't change any of that stuff. Okay. Then things start to get really complicated. 1547 is when Henry died, leaving the throne to his nine-year-old son, Edward VI. Nine years old, you're not making very many decisions. So he's really doing what the advisors tell him to do. And Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, was a pretty influential guy. And he starts pushing more and more Protestant reforms. We get the institution of the Book of Common Prayer. which changed some of the prayers that everybody knew and uh, did some other things that upset the Catholic folks in England and they started having some <coughs> sexual violent protests about this and those protests were met with stronger violence. So Edward VI was ready to order in the army to kill people who were protesting these Protestant reforms. So we would say further religious violence here. This time it is against Catholics. If you would like to look at the Book of Common Prayer, you will get a chance today a chapel. It's in the, it's right there. There's a primary source reading you can do during chapel. But of course you'll be fascinated by what's happening in chapel. Okay, so then that didn't last very long because in the 1550s, Edward II died. Sorry, Edward VI died leaving his older sister, Mary Tudor, to take the throne. 
Mary Tudor was very Catholic. So she does an absolute about-face reverse in the country of England. Now, if you're Protestant, we're going to kill you. So she persecutes Protestants. I'm glad I did not live in England during this time. I would have been confused. She sort of repeals the Book of Common Prayer. She doesn't want any of this stuff. She kills Protestants for heresy. She was not widely liked. Her nicknames include Bloody Mary. Ah, right? But she doesn't last long. 1558, she died and Queen Elizabeth took over. Elizabeth is Protestant. Anybody confused yet? She, she is a little bit calmer, however. She has seen this flip-flopping back and forth. She's lived through it all. She's pretty clever. She actually is the second longest reigning monarch in English history, second only to the current queen. Um, and the Elizabethan era is named after her. She really is, a, she is a great ruler for England, but what she does is settle everything down. So she makes some reforms that just meet in the middle. Okay, it's called the Elizabethan Settlement. So it meets everyone in the middle. She keeps the Mass pretty much the same as the Catholic Mass. She goes back to the Book of Common Prayer, but it's a less different version than the one that Edward had done. Um, and so, so she just makes it comfortable enough for people who want it to be Catholic that it's similar enough. And it's different enough to keep the Protestants happy that they're not actually being Catholic. And she is able to calm these religious struggles in England before they all end in the rest of Europe. So the rest of Europe is going to see years and years more of religious warfare, uh, but Elizabeth is able to calm it in England. All right, so that's sort of the end of the English Reformation. She is able to really institute those changes and have that be the end of it. So then we get, sorry, we get the Catholic Reformation, or the Counter-Reformation. So this is the answer from the Catholics to what happened in the regular Reformation. And I guess some of this is sort of too little too late, but they tried. <clears throat> so we have this is led by Paul the Third. And it's 1530s through 50s. And the major piece of work that this is done by calling a church council, and this is called the Council of Trent. And they were called in 1545 and met off and on for book tells us 20 years before they really came up with all this, all their teachings. Um, and they, they sort of looked at what was going on. They looked at the complaints of Martin Luther and other Protestants. They looked at their own history and teachings, and they pretty much reaffirmed their own teachings. They didn't, they didn't change much about what the church taught. So they said, they said, no, we still believe salvation comes from faith and works, not just faith, Mr. Luther, you're wrong about that. All right, they said the Bible is not the only source of truth. You have to also look at our teachings. What the church says is also true. 
The smart sounding word for this is papal infallibility. The Pope does not say anything wrong. Sorry, folks, he just doesn't. So that is a, a reconfirmation of that idea. But they did also say, we've been kind of corrupt, <coughs> and we need to stop that. So they do root out a lot of corruption. And I like this phrase, corruption and worldliness. This meaning having too much, you priests are having too much to do with the world that you're in rather than the next one. So stop having too much to do with the world you're in. And the other thing they did is they made better schools for priests. So the priests were better able to answer people's complaints about church doctrine and all that sort of stuff. So they educated the clergy better. Uh, I have this here, but it's not going to work. Cut it out. Next up, why not? We'll have the Inquisition come back. So, in Catholic lands, the Inquisition was the group that really held the Catholic rules. And they did it by all means fair and foul. Torture, secret testimonies, all that kind of stuff, they were, they were good at that kind of thing. Probably the most longest lasting piece of the Inquisition was the Index of Forbidden Books. Which of course included everything by Martin Luther, everything by John Calvin, everything by Petrarch, everything by Erasmus. Don't want people reading those things, because if you read them, then you'll start thinking, and that'll be bad. This index, I believe, is still available. I didn't get enough time to find if it is still out there, but somebody can look that up. Uh, this group gets founded, the Jesuits. <coughs> Very popular with the Pope and with other leaders at the time. And they basically took sort of a military outlook on a religious education and missionary uh, idea. So they were monks. They were trained very, very closely. They had very great you know, discipline. They're up early in the morning, working all day bed late at night, lots of prayer, and this idea that it is their mission, it is their job to go out into the world and make sure that people know what Catholicism is and how to apply it in your daily life. And they were among the first missionaries to get into the New World and convert, start converting natives to Christianity. They were in Africa, they were, in, they were going into Protestant lands in Northern Europe, just like they were going into Africa. You're going to try to convert these Protestants at risk of death and all of that. Um, they were found by Ignatius of Loyola, which will let you know that like Loyola University, that's a Jesuit school. There's a lot of Jesuit schools out there. They founded a lot of them. So these reforms strengthened the Catholic Church. They helped the Catholic Church sort of come back and say, okay, we know we were wrong about the corrupt stuff. We're getting rid of that. But we stand by our teachings. We're not afraid of our teachings. We like them. And that was, that was good for Catholic areas. It didn't, didn't mean that all Protestants said, oh, we're sorry, now that you've changed, we're coming back. They, they stayed away. But it was a good thing, I think, for the Catholic Church to reform some of those things. Uh, 
uh, to end this chapter, we have the last little bit here of widespread persecution. First part of that is witchcraft. We have about, whoops, we have about 400, 300 years of witch trials. Obviously, these are not precise dates, somewhere in that range. Um, tens of thousands of women mostly were killed, men were also killed as being witches. And most of this happened to occur in places where there was fighting between Catholics and Protestants. Where there was some kind of other religious conflict is where most of the witch trials were held. Probably not a coincidence. Alright, so <coughs> popular in conflicted places. And the targets, not too surprising. Women were obviously, the vast majority of witches were women. Social outcasts, people you didn't see that much and didn't know and they were kind of weird, so they must be witches. And uh, midwives. I don't know, they do all this strange, they go in the closed room with the woman who's pregnant and there's lots of screaming and blood and, and it, that's just got to be bad. There's something bad happening there. Because the men weren't part of that process. It's all a big closed door mystery. And lots of times the infants died. It was a pretty brutal process in the you know, 1500s to have a baby. So it's easy to place the blame on the woman who was there to help and it failed. Right? It's not pretty, but it certainly happened quite a lot. And then the other one is Jewish persecution. There's a long history of this in Europe. And I came up with a little rhyme to help you remember one little fact about this. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And Spain kicked all the Jews out, too. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and Spain kicked all the Jews out, too. It's true, they did. They expelled all the Jews from Spain in 1492. Uh, Italy was nicer, kind of. But in 1516, this is a, a, a good date to know, Venice created the first ghetto. Italians added many great things to our Western culture. The ghetto is not one of them. This is a like a two-block radius where all the Jews had to live in the city of Venice. And other cities thought, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So throughout Italy, throughout Europe, cities just said, okay, all the Jews, you have to live over here now. We can keep an eye on you. You stay over there. We'll stay over here. Um, and Martin Luther was very, very anti-Semitic. So he starts writing about the Jews and how bad they are. So Protestant countries also become pretty wickedly anti-Semitic. Kicking them out, denying them rights, all that kind of stuff. Basically, Martin Luther had hoped that the Jews would convert to his awesome new version of Christianity <coughs> But the Jews didn't, they said, no, it's still Christianity, and we're still Jewish, so we're not going to go there. Um, Jews weren't allowed to go to the New World that was owned by Spain, because they'd kicked the Jews out. That included the New World owned by Spain. So it's not like they could go try something else in the new place, either. So we see a restriction on their rights. Many of them tried to escape out to the Mediterranean, 
and also up into the Netherlands, which had a very strange policy of allowing religious freedom. So the Netherlands really was it for them. And here endeth the chapter.